In this video, we'll talk about solving nonlinear equations. Nonlinear equations are considerably more difficult to solve than linear equations. Usually, the solution of nonlinear equations is iterative, which means that you guess a solution, check whether the solution is correct, and then make another guess. You keep guessing and checking until you get a solution to the equations that's good enough. This process is tedious if you perform it by hand, but as usual, computers are good at the repetitive processes involved. There are lots of ways to solve nonlinear equations. In this video, I'll introduce one of the simplest, the bisection method. Linear equations represent straight lines, and they can be written in matrix form. By contrast, nonlinear equations do not represent straight lines. All of these are nonlinear equations. The squared term here is nonlinear, this sine term is nonlinear, and this product of independent variables makes this equation nonlinear. One side effect of these nonlinearities is that these equations cannot be placed in matrix form. In this video, I'll only talk about solving nonlinear equations that are a function of a single independent variable. The form I'll put the equation in will be f of x is equal to zero. This is a fairly standard form, and nonlinear systems of equations can be placed in this form by eliminating the undesired unknowns. For example, I have this system of equations. I can find a single equation that's a function of x1 by solving one of the equations for x2 and then substituting that into the other equation. So if I solve the first equation for x2, I get x2 is equal to 3 minus 3x1 over 2. Then I can plug that in down here for x2. I get 2x1 times 3 minus 3x1 over 2 plus 4x1 is equal to 12. This 2 cancels with this 2. This becomes 3x1 plus 4x1 is 7x1 minus 3x1 squared. If I bring this over to this side, that's minus 12 equal to zero, this equation is of this form. Graphically, the function f of x might look like this. The solution to this equation requires us to find the value of x that makes f of x equal to zero. So we want the value x1 at this point here. One thing that makes nonlinear functions difficult to deal with is that their solutions are not generally unique. That means that there may be multiple values of x that make f of x equal to zero. This is particularly frustrating for engineers, since you may design your system to operate over here, but the system actually decides to operate over here. That'll generally not result in a viable design, and the system can even fail catastrophically. As I mentioned before, solution approaches for nonlinear equations tend to be iterative meaning that it takes multiple steps to determine the solution. Typically, these steps consist of guessing a solution and then using the result of that guess to make another guess. The process repeats until a solution converges to a consistent result. Our solution approach will be the bisection method. This approach has good and bad features. It's guaranteed that you'll find a solution, but the convergence of the approach is relatively slow, so it may require a lot of computations. The approach begins by choosing an interval on the x-axis that contains the solution. The interval is then cut in half, and the section of the interval that contains the solution is identified. Then you just repeat the process of halving the interval until you get close enough to the solution. Let's go through this process for an example function. First, we have to choose an interval within which the function is zero. In this class, we'll use a very simple criterion for this. We'll just look for a sign change between the two endpoints of the interval. This is actually a pretty simplistic requirement. Checking a sign change between the endpoints really just means that there are an odd number of zero crossings in the interval. But we'll assume that it implies a single zero crossing as shown here. Now let's take a look at how we can decide whether the sign changes between the endpoints A and B. There are a couple of easy ways to use octave to tell whether there's a sign change between two points. The first is with the sign command. The sign command returns a 1 if the argument is positive and negative 1 if the argument's negative. 
So if the sine of the function at a is not equal to the sine of the function at b, there must be a zero between a and b. Possibly an easier way to check for a sign change is to take the product of the value of the function at a times the value of the function at b. If the product is negative, there's a sign change. Now let's take a look at how we can reduce the size of the interval within which the sign change occurs. Suppose that we have an interval bounded by the points a and b within which the function has a zero. We know there's a zero in the interval because we've determined that the sign of the function changes between points a and b. Now find the midpoint of the interval. This halves or bisects the interval. After we've bisected the interval, determine the value of the function at the midpoint. From this, we can decide which side of the midpoint the solution to the equation is on. The endpoints of the interval are then redefined based on where the sign change occurs. In this example, the sign change is on the right half. So I can redefine the midpoint as point A. If the sign change happened on this side, I would have redefined the midpoint as B. Now let's repeat the process with the new smaller interval. First, find the midpoint of the interval. Then find the value of the function at the midpoint and determine on which side of the interval the sign change occurs. Finally, redefine the interval so that the sign change is within the new interval. Then just repeat this process, making the interval smaller and smaller until you're close enough to the solution. Now let's decide what we mean by close enough to the actual solution. There are two common approaches. One is that the value of the function at the midpoint of the interval is close enough to zero. The other is that the range of x values in the interval is small enough so that having the interval doesn't make a difference. Now let's take a look at some pseudocode to implement the overall strategy. I'm going to outline a very simplistic approach to the bisection method, which does contain some shortcomings. The goal here is to give an idea of how the method works rather than a foolproof approach that's robust to errors. First, I'll choose an interval on the x-axis within which there's a sign change. I'm going to choose this interval arbitrarily and then check to make sure that there's a sign change between a and b. The test I'll use for this is that the product of the value of the function at a and at b is negative. Next, bisect the interval by calculating the value of the midpoint of the interval. I'll call this value x sub m and it's just the average of the values a and b. Then, calculate the value of the function at the midpoint of the interval. Now, check to see which side of the midpoint the function zero is on and redefine the interval to contain the zero crossing. I'll do this by checking to see whether there's a sign change between the left side of the interval, a, and the midpoint, x sub m. If the sign change is between a and x sub m, move the right side of the interval, b, to x sub m. If the sign change isn't between a and x sub m, I'll assume that the sign change is on the other side of the interval, and I'll move the left side of the interval, a, to x sub m. This is another place where a problem can creep in. If I'm unlucky and the midpoint is where the value of the function is exactly zero, the interval will no longer contain the zero crossing and I won't find the solution. Now I need to decide whether I'm close enough to the solution or if I need to bisect the interval again. One approach to determine whether to reduce the interval size again is to check the value of the function at the midpoint. If this value is within some tolerance, we can stop bisecting the interval. An alternate approach is to see if the range of possible x values defined by the interval is within some tolerance. This concludes my discussion of the solution of nonlinear equations. I've really only scratched the surface of this topic. My goal here was just to illustrate the basic idea common to all numerical solution approaches to nonlinear equations. The solutions are iterative so that they start with an initial guess as to what the solution is, and the guess is refined over multiple steps to obtain a solution that's good enough. Lots of other solution approaches exist most of which are more efficient than the bisection method. The octave function f0, for example, chooses among a variety of approaches to find zeros of functions.